Hello everyone and welcome back to Arctic Retro and in today's video I'm gonna take a look at this the Spectra Video SVI 328MK2 As you can see, I got the box and uh, the machine itself looks very nice, clean and uh, white. I'm gonna tell you more about this uh, machine later, but uh, for now we're gonna just uh, explore it and see what uh, it can do and uh, if it uh, actually works. And uh, in the box I actually got uh, the user's manual and uh, the power supply. So. Uh, there's nothing more, I have no games or software for it and uh, no cartridges so we're gonna test out how to get some games running on this one uh, without having a tape cassette deck or cartridges. This video is sponsored by PCBWay. PCBWay produces very good quality PCBs at uh, affordable prices. Besides that, they also do services like CNC machining, 3D printing, PCB assembly and advanced PCB. If you are in the need of an already made PCB design, go visit their shared project sites where you can find a lot of high quality PCB designs. Check out PCBWay.com Spectra Video International was an American computer manufacturer and software house founded in 1981. They started by making gaming cartridges and add-ons for the Atari 2600. The SVI 318 and 328 was their first real computers. In 1993 the company uh, ran into some financial troubles and uh, after that uh, a couple of computers was uh, released uh, that was MSX compatible, the 728 and the 838 which was the last computer they produced and that one was a PC and MSX2 compatible computer. This computer, the SVI 328MK2, was released in 1984 and it was a revised version with a new motherboard. This is an 8-bit uh, home computer uh, which has 80 kilobytes of RAM with 32 kilobytes of ROM. The computer is not MSX compliant although the MSX standard was actually based on uh, the specs of this machine. It has a Scilog set 80 CPU running at 3.6 MHz and it runs the Microsoft Extended Basic as an operating system. The graphics is based on the TMS9918 chip with uh, a resolution of 256 x 192 and it has an AY38910 sound chip. I have tested the machine uh, briefly a couple of months ago and it did uh, power on so I'm confident that it is uh, working and uh, yeah it's the 80k RAM version it has 64 kilobytes of RAM that is usable for basic and uh, the rest is uh, dedicated for uh, the VDC the video chip on the back we have some uh, expansion port and this is the cassette uh, interface and uh, RF output and uh, this I think is uh, composite video and uh, audio and it is a PAL version made in Hong Kong serial number <laughs> pretty large one and on the side you have joystick port and a power switch and a power contact the power supply is the original uh, Spectra video and it is um, 220 volts AC input and uh, output is uh, just AC 16 volts and 9 volts. <laughs> All right, let's hook it up to the TV and see what we get. I'm just going to connect uh, to the RF uh, modulator and uh, I have my TV tuned in to uh, channel 36, I think. <laughs> 
but there's uh, no signal so uh, probably uses another channel so I need to uh, go into the menu and uh, do a search for a channel the keyboard looks uh, very nice and clean and uh, there's this uh, button here which uh, is not a button it is a power on indicator <laughs> All right, it found something. There's a picture, but it's uh, very noisy. <laughs> but that might be due to the low C RF cable I'm using. There it is, SV Extended Basic version 1.1, copyright 1983 by Microsoft. As you can see, the picture is very noisy. So I think I'll instead try the composite video out. This was just for testing purposes. I hooked up the video cable now to a SCART adapter and let's see. Yeah, that's a lot better. Actually quite all right. That's a little closer and this machine too has some jail bars, which is common on the Commodore 64, but they are very faint. And as always with a new machine, I have to write a little program. And as always, the keyboard is uh, fairly unknown. But the key seems to work very nice. Hello there. <laughs> so I'm trying to stop this program from running. There's a stop key, but escape does not work. Let's try control C, no. Control stop. Yeah, control stop. <laughs> nice. So uh, the words on the bottom of the screen, color auto go to list and run. I think those are mapped to the, the function keys. Like F5, it runs the program. And uh, F4 then is list. And F1 is color. Let's change it to two. <laughs> oh man, that was gross. All right, the machine seems to be working, but uh, now we have to take a look inside and see what we have there. Let's open it up. It seems to have three screws uh, on this side and uh, three in the front. The screw seems to be very hard and uh, that might indicate this machine has uh, not been opened before. There's a sticker here, need to lift it a little bit. All right, let's see now. Don't rush the opening because you can rip some cables. All right, so the keyboard is um, has this very stiff um, plastic uh, flat cables and they seem to be <laughs> soldered directly to the motherboard. So uh, we can't remove it easily, but we can uh, perhaps uh, tilt it forward. So that's not very nice. I'm afraid to break these uh, old ribbon cables, but no, it's standing. All right, so what do we got here? The motherboard, it looks so uh, tidy and uh, quite simple actually. And um, yeah, it has a dedicated sound chip and uh, AY. This is probably the CPU, uh, set 80 Scilog. And it also has a VDC, which is um, the video display controller. Not sure if it's this one or this, but um, this one was a little odd. It has a large heatsink and it's glued down. <laughs> Not very nice. And uh, here's the video circuitry as a separate PCB. Everything looks all right, so um, can't see anything right away. Very clean, so <laughs> either this machine hasn't been used much or it has been cleaned by somebody else before. I don't know the history of this machine. I just purchased it from a seller here in Norway. Actually on closer inspection, this is actually the Z80 CPU. This is the ULA and uh, this is uh, then probably the VDC chip. And this daughter board of course also has the um, circuitry for uh, the cassette, which is here. 
I actually saw that there has been done some soldering on this one. Probably someone trying to um, connect an uh, audio cable to a modern device like a phone to run games from. And here we have a large uh, heat sink uh, with the voltage regulators. At least this one is uh, 7805 and uh, yeah, I can't read this one. Probably 12 volts then. All right, everything looks uh, nice and clean, but I'm just gonna do some light uh, cleaning with some IPA anyway, just to see if there's any oxidation or dust that I can remove. Not much actually. All right, there isn't much to do with this machine uh, in the inside of it. And uh, I can, of course, uh, replace the capacitors and the uh, voltage regulators and uh, yeah, maybe use some modern switching voltage regulator, but I'm not gonna do that now because then I have to make an inventory first and order the parts. Just gonna close it up and then we can uh, take it for a test and see if we can load something to it from, uh, from the cassette port. I'm just gonna measure now the power supply and the output. So I'm gonna measure between uh, pin one and two first. On AC and yeah 19 volts at 50 Hertz and it should be 16 volts so but I think that's uh, within the range and between those two there is uh, 11 volts AC which should be 9 volts so that's probably within uh, spec also but maybe I'm measuring it uh, the wrong way just try between uh, 2 and 4 and there's actually 10 volts. All right, but I think this is uh, working just fine. Okay, so we need to download some uh, games for this machine. And there are probably several resources on the internet, but uh, if you go to sandal.com slash svsoftware.htm, there's a pretty good archive there. And uh, yeah, there's actually a good amount of information about the history and uh, documents and things for Spectra Video. And if you scroll down on this page, there's a download link that uh, you can download the complete Spectra Video collection. So I'm gonna do that. And here's actually some uh, nice uh, PDFs, uh, Spectra Video software brochures. Let's take a look at those. SVI software. So this is like uh, the games catalog for SVI 318 and 328. And uh, the other one is uh, software library. Yeah, it looks to be uh, similar to the other one. So there's a lot of good information here. This is the history of Spectra Video timeline. And if you go to uh, hardware, there's a list of the computers with uh, some nice um, technical details and things like that. So yeah, really nice. And uh, I think this uh, page is actually a Norwegian uh, web page because if you go to uh, just the URL, you come to a Norwegian page. <laughs> All right, so my understanding of this machine is that it uh, didn't have many great games written for it. Uh, most games were either uh, yeah, basic programs or uh, simple uh, machine code uh, written games. Uh, and there are some uh, MSX ported games, uh, but uh, not that many actually the msx computers had a lot more games written for them so how do we load the uh, games on this well uh, it doesn't have a 3.5 uh, millimeter audio jack input uh, that many other machines have it has this edge connector like the commodore 64 i don't have a connector to fit uh, this one so i would have to make one uh, but I'll look into that in a minute, but I'm uh, thinking I'm not going to use actual tape because I don't have any, but I'm going to use this one. It's an uh, Arduino based uh, emulator that emulates uh, 
a tape player uh, with the files stored on uh, an SD card and uh, we're gonna try this. I have used this on uh, ZX Spectrum before and it worked great uh, there. This is called an uh, TCX Duino or CAS Duino and it uh, supports uh, several different uh, audio file formats and the uh, ones I downloaded is actually CAS files and so this should uh, work. Um, you have to connect a 3.5 millimeter uh, audio jack to it and uh, yeah then we need to connect uh, to either this uh, edge connector or somewhere inside the computer and uh, the signals for the cassette port is actually going right through to the internal connector to the motherboard so I was thinking maybe I could just um, solder on um, the wires for the audio cable and feed it out here or maybe I could uh, drill a hole uh, somewhere to just have a permanent connection I'm not really sure what I'm gonna do and of course I didn't buy the exactly correct cable because this is the one that also has a microphone and it has uh, four connectors uh, but that's not a problem I just uh, cut the wires and uh, then I connect this uh, mono 3.5 millimeter jack to this one and it should work. Uh, I already measured that um, green and black are um, the ground and uh, the red one is uh, the other, the audio signal and uh, the white one is then not used so we can just uh, cut it off. So now we have reduced this uh, cable from a uh, audio stereo and the microphone input to uh, just a mono cable. So now I'm gonna solder in that cable to this uh, board so I'm just uh, taking it out so I can access uh, uh, the solder points. Try not to break anything. <laughs> so the signals we're gonna connect to is the CAS R which is uh, read and we're not gonna bother with writing so no need to think about that and then the ground point uh, and there's also some motor control uh, signals but uh, I don't think those are uh, necessary, they are just there to start and stop the motor of the cassette player which we don't have. So it seems that it's um, been done before or at least an attempt to do it but uh, that's not the correct pins. Uh, this one which I marked with black is the, the reed and uh, this one is the ground but uh, I'm gonna solder onto those. Let's see now if I can manage to solder on these wires. Just clean a little bit first and a little bit of the flux. Actually I'm gonna solder uh, the wires the other way like this. Okay I think that's good. So now this can uh, go underneath this board and uh, come out through here or here. Before I test with the device I'm gonna just connect this uh, mono cable and check if the connections are good. So use my multimeter just checking the ground first it can be anywhere like here. That seems to be good and then the other one is a little bit harder because uh, this uh, connector is um, glued down to the board but the different the wires on this uh, cable are marked here and we see that this one is the CAS R the read signal so it should be this one on the other side so I'll just try to pry through the plastic uh, here it's this one <laughs> I missed 
Yeah, so there seems to be a good connection now and we are ready to test. By the way, having a user manual is really helpful. Uh, you learn a lot about the machine by reading it and it also contains a lot of documentation like all the basic commands, all the connector pins and stuff like that, so really nice. I copied all the files to this um, SD card and uh, now I'm gonna see if it works. Just connected to some power here, uh, 5 volt input, and uh, this was not the correct uh, contact. <laughs> Here's the one with the USB mini connector. So. Alright, it says Arduino. It just shows you all um, the folders on the memory card and uh, we're gonna switch to... Uh, I made a folder named SVI. This blue is play and now it goes into post. And if we had the motor control connected it would uh, then uh, start with a signal from the computer but uh, I don't have that. And the command to load is C load. Cassette load, I guess. Press play on tape, and now I can just press play here. Uh, not TCX tape. I know that. Well, well, it wouldn't work without connecting the audio cable, would it? <laughs> so, let's see now. Doesn't seem to be playing, uh, so uh, maybe I missed something here. Um, since it says not TCX tape, which is correct, I was under the impression that this could also play back CAS files. So I guess this is just for TCX files, for the ZX Spectrum and the likes. Uh, but I got this one and this is called, I think this is called the TCX slash CAS Duino, so I'm gonna try. Uh, that one instead. Maybe we're lucky there. Max Duino, it's called. So it's the same with this one. You select the folder, go into that, and select the file and press play. And then it's paused and play again. So now it doesn't complain at least. <laughs> Nope, it won't load anything, it just says uh, press play on tape and uh, that uh, makes me wonder and I actually uh, did a little bit uh, more research and I think you need um, the signal for the cassette motor to be enabled in order for it to start reading, so uh, I have to do something with that. So this was not as easy as I uh, originally thought. Uh, it seems that you actually need to uh, pull down uh, the ready signal. If you take a look at uh, this one, you actually need to tie this uh, ready signal uh, to ground in order for the computer to continue after the press play on tape message. And I have uh, found the schematics and here you can see the ready signal on uh, Pin 38 is actually pulled up to 5 volts. So in order to signal ready from the tape player, you need to tie this to ground, 0 volts. And since I don't have uh, any motor control uh, on this uh, CAS Duino, I'm uh, actually wondering if uh, the CAS on signal here on pin 13 needs to be uh, high. But I'll try first to uh, to tie the ready signal uh, low and that should indicate that uh, the cassette player is ready all the time. And the simplest way to tie the <laughs> ready signal to uh, ground is actually just to connect from ground. Um, no, it's actually this one from ground here and this is the ready signal. It's reverse now because it's upside down. <laughs> so I made a little jumper wire. I'm just gonna solder that in there and then we'll try again all right that looks good i think not the prettiest solder job but um, yeah should do the trick <laughs>
before I test, I'm actually going to measure if the read signal actually uh, goes all the way from um, the cable and uh, to the 8255 chip. According to the schematics, this should be uh, pin 37. So let's try 40, 39, 38, 37, this one. Yeah, and there's a good um, connection there. So um, that's good so far. All right, let's see now, do we come any further? See load. So no, it didn't display the press play on tape. So now I'm actually trying to start this thing. It is playing, but uh, there's nothing. <laughs> so uh, maybe there's more work to do. So I can't get it to work. Uh, tried several uh, times and also changed the settings on the Max Duino, but uh, no luck uh, yet. So I think I have to take out the oscilloscope and uh, try and uh, see what signals we get into the pin on the chip. <laughs> now I'm gonna try and uh, use the scope to uh, figure out if the signal is coming into the 8255 chip as it is supposed to do. So I have hooked up uh, the Pico scope, which is a PC based uh, oscilloscope that you connect via USB to a Windows PC or Mac. I have typed the C load now and I'm starting uh, playing here and uh, let's see if we get the signal on uh, pin 37 here. Let's see now, I have uh, set the scale to 10 volts DC and uh, two microsecond divisions and I'm now probing uh, pin 37. Yeah, and that looks like a good signal, uh, right about five volts. So there seems to be no issue this far. So then I just need to figure out what happens after uh, this uh, IO chip. All right, so I did some more checks and uh, double checked everything and I even uh, installed the latest the Max Duino um, firmware onto this uh, device, the first one I tried and uh, now it actually runs on this one and it uh, seems to be working okay. However, I could still not get uh, anything to load so <laughs> I discussed the case a little bit more with uh, Noel at uh, Noel's Retro Lab and uh, Actually, he, uh, he thought it was kind of strange, uh, but he sent me a file that I can test with and uh, what do you know, that actually worked uh, right away. So um, the thing is that the, the file archive I have downloaded with uh, all those uh, CAS files, none of them works with uh, the Max uh, Duino and um, they do actually work with uh, Blue Max. Uh, MSX emulator, so uh, uh, that's a bit strange, but uh, probably some uh, odd format on those files. And I also tried to convert um, the CAS files to WAVE by using the CAS tools, the CAS to WAVE tool, and uh, it failed on uh, those files. So uh, I don't know what's the issue with uh, that CAS files, but uh, anyway, no, I'm ready to test some games on this machine. So uh, it turns out that the solution was simple. <laughs> However, that's not a problem. Uh, that made me do some diagnostics and I actually learned a few bits uh, about this machine. So <laughs> that's okay. I actually got another archive of some games from uh, Noel. He's a really nice guy and uh, you should uh, visit his channel if you didn't do it already. <laughs> but uh, let's see here what we got. Um, let's try this one. Saxon and these are actually um, not CAS files, they are TSX files. That's another uh, tape archive um, uh, standard I think. So uh, I'm gonna try and play and um, yeah, enter the C load command. I already tested with uh, one file uh, right before, but uh, let's try this one. I didn't test this one. Okay, found Saxon. Great. And now uh, it actually just loaded um, the loader. So uh, since this um, 
uh, isn't connected to the motor control, you actually need to pause it and um, then we type run. Saxon is loaded and then you press uh, play again. And it takes a while to load because uh, even though it's uh, loading from an SD card, it's actually the same speed as loading from the original tape. All right, it loaded right away. <laughs> nice. All right, so here's the options. I'm gonna select the one player at skill one. That actually took five minutes to load. All right, you can use the, the cursor keys. <laughs> And as usual, I die right away. <laughs> nice. A little bit simpler version than on the Commodore 64. I'm gonna insert a joystick, see if that works. That works, all right. <laughs> but I still die. The sound is a bit terrible. Let me try another one. And this time um, Arkanoid. Found Arkan. There's no loading indication or anything, so you just have to wait until it completes. <laughs> that loaded just fine. Let's see now if we can uh, play a little bit with the joystick. Yeah. I used to play this game a lot uh, back in the day on uh, the Commodore 64. Really fun game. <laughs> I'm not very good at it. <laughs> Now we're talking. <laughs> Next up is uh, Armored Assault and uh, this one seems to be loading into the screen memory so we at least get a little feedback about the loading. If anyone knows how I can convert those CAS files to uh, TSX files uh, or why I can't load them with the uh, Max Duino, then please uh, send me a message. Armored Assault. They look very similar, a lot of these games. <laughs> so this seems to be a two player game. So the other guy is not moving because he's not here. <laughs> Maybe he can use the arrows. No, that's me. Okay, I guess I'll win then. <laughs> Let me try one more. Crunch. This one didn't have a loader, so it's probably a basic uh, game, basic program. Yeah, that's the listing. Crunch. Joystick, easy. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> well, well. 
Oh, this was a terrible game, but uh, I guess this is what you can expect when a game is written in uh, basic. Okay, that was it for this video. Uh, I now have a way of loading uh, games onto this machine using this connector and um, that was the goal of this uh, video. There's not a lot of uh, software to be found for this machine online and I really wish that uh, the collection I initially found on Samdal uh, would be available. Uh, maybe somebody has an idea how to uh, convert it to a readable format. Uh, so thanks for watching and a special thank you to my Patreons. Uh, see you, bye bye.